All right, the passion and the glory. This is uh, lesson four in this five lesson series. Title of this lesson, His Last Command. After his uh, resurrection, uh, the apostles record at least 12 separate occasions where Jesus appeared to, to his people and to um, uh, his uh, apostles, different disciples in small groups, and at one occasion to a crowd of over 500 people in one location. We know that during this time he ate with them, he taught them, he encouraged them, he prayed with them had a lot of personal interaction, something you don't see when you hear stories of other religions, their holy men or their prophets, uh, usually uh, you know, this type of appearance uh, you know, doesn't occur. So many over so long a period of time, so many people. Then on the 40th day, Luke tells us that he uh, gathered his apostles and took them for a walk Luke 24 and 50, Acts 1, 12. They left Jerusalem and they headed towards Bethany on the same road that goes through the Mount of Olives where he had prayed on the night before his passion. Luke mentions that they had gone about a Sabbath day's distance. Uh, in that time, Jews were only allowed to walk 2,000 paces on the Sabbath day. So when they say a Sabbath day's distance, they meant 2,000 paces. Uh, 2,000 paces would put them where the, approximately where the, the road here branches into two directions. One side would take them to Jericho, the other side would take them to Bethany. And so as they walked and talked, Jesus reminded them to stay in Jerusalem until they received the power from the Holy Spirit. He told them that after they had received this power, they were to become witnesses of everything that they had seen and heard and of course they were to you know, give this witness uh, to all the world. Uh, they were to talk about his life, his miracles, his teachings, his death, and of course his resurrection. He then stopped walking, he faced them, lifted up his hands, he prayed a blessing upon them, and as they listened to his prayer, he began to rise up into the sky until he was taken completely into their clouds and out of sight. Now there was something very different about this departure, <clears throat> different in comparison to the time uh, in the previous month where he had appeared to them in different uh, places. Every other time in the last 40 days he had merely appeared and then disappeared. This time, however, he visibly ascended into the sky until they could no longer uh, see him. Luke tells us in Acts chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, that as they looked, two men in white, we presume these are angels, told them to return to Jerusalem and wait for the power promised by Jesus, who would one day return from the heavens in the same way that he ascended. They said he, he will come back and descend in the same way. We read that passage in Acts chapter 1, verse 10 to 11. It says, and as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. So they went away amazed. And while they waited 10 more days in Jerusalem for the power of the Holy Spirit to descend upon them, they had time to ponder the incredible final command that he had given during his, you know, his last few moments with them. So this lesson here is entitled, His Last Command. Both Matthew and Mark record different occasions when Jesus gave his apostles their final instructions. And this is a pretty familiar verse uh, for us. Uh, Matthew 28, but the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even to the end of the age. 
And then the same command in a kind of a different uh, format here in Mark. Uh, he says, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved uh, shall be condemned. These signs will accompany those who have believed in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Mark 16, 16, 17, and 18. So basically, that's the last command. So basically, the command could be broken down into three parts. First of all, they were to tell the good news of Jesus who died to pay for the sins of all men, and then rose from the dead to prove his divinity to every person in the world. Secondly, they were to baptize, and we know that to baptize means to immerse, they were to immerse in water, those who believed their witness about Jesus and uh, who repented of their sins. And then thirdly, they were to teach the converts to know and obey everything that Jesus commanded so that they would become faithful disciples as well. So that's, the, you know, that's the, the, the breakdown of that final command. And you see, it seems simple. I mean, you know, it's not very complicated. It's, uh, you, know, there, you don't need to be a, a Bible scholar and know the Greek and the, you know, have to, it, you see it right at face value. Preach the gospel, baptize repentant believers, teach them all the things that Jesus uh, commanded. And yet in the modern religious world, especially in the world of quote Christianity, how many ways have people diverted from this very simple thing? Uh, the, you know, the number one question on, on Bible talk, the, the question that keeps coming back over and over again, and people all over the world ask this question, it's always about baptism. They always question, well, do we really need to be baptized? Or well, you know, baptized, that's a Church of Christ thing, you know, all the time. And yet, <laughs> how, I don't know if he could have made it plainer than this. And yet, you know, so many have managed to kind of change uh, these basic things that he uh, commanded. So this command and its execution was critical because in carrying it out, the apostles would create a turning point for mankind in its relationship with God. When they began preaching the gospel, baptizing repentant believers and teaching them the way and the words of Christ, three things happened that had never happened before. For the first time in the history of mankind, there was absolute exclusivity in religion. Up until this time, all religions were inclusive. Until this time, religion was very much a cultural or a tribal thing. Each country had its religion and gods, and when countries merged through wars and alliances, so did their gods, so did their deities. You know, when the Romans took over the Greeks, they simply Romanized the Greek gods. There was strength in numbers, and so the more gods you had, the better off you were. Jesus told them to preach only Him. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Matthew 28. Peter boldly declared this fact to the religious leaders of his day. In Acts 4.12 he says, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Again, such a clear uh, you know, statement. How can you confuse that? I've said many times before, you don't have to agree with this. You, you can reject this, you can say, oh, I don't believe this, or I reject this, or you know, this, that's not for me. You're free to do that all you want. But what you cannot do is say, the Bible doesn't teach exclusivity. You can't say that. This one verse right here, you don't have to have 10 verses. This one verse spoken by Peter the apostle says, there is salvation in no one else. I, you can't twist that to mean something else, okay? So this is the reason that the apostles were tortured and killed. You know, not that they preached about a mere religion. You know, they had thousands of gods and religions in their day. They were martyred because they dared to say that Jesus Christ was the only way a person could come to God. That's what got people upset. Nothing has changed today. 
People may not like it, they may disagree with it, they may even reject it, but no one can deny that Jesus Christ demands exclusive loyalty to Himself. And that the Bible teaches that a person cannot be saved from hell by any other person or religion. 2,000 years later, people still hate this idea and anyone who preaches it. In our society, we're at the point in history where only two concepts in religion remain. One is inclusive, which is represented by those who espouse religious pluralism. This concept includes as valid all disciplines and all religions for the common good. Most churches and religions are going in this direction, as well as most educational systems. All religions are good. Mm. You're a Hindu, great, good for you. You're a Muslim, say, terrific. You Christians, yeah, it's all big, it's all big happy family. You know, God's up here and you know, uh, all the religions are down here you know, and they're all working their way up to the top. That's the modern theory. The only problem with that theory is it's not true. <laughs> it's not true biblically. The Bible does not teach that. The other concept of religion, which the Bible teaches, is exclusivity, which is represented by, the New, Test by New Testament Christianity. New Testament Christianity declares that there's only one way to God, and that's through Jesus Christ, no other way. So after His resurrection, Jesus commanded His apostles to preach that He and only He could save men to the exclusion of every other God or religion, philosophy or prophet. Much tension and conflict concerning religion throughout history has been caused by Christianity's demand for exclusivity and will continue until He returns to vindicate those who believe and depend on Him. It's just not a popular thing to say. Now this is a hard idea to accept, especially in our country where we pride ourselves on being tolerant of every religion, every viewpoint. You are a uh, openly gay practicing uh, pedophile, but you believe in uh, Buddha, good, <laughs> good for you. That's, that's, our, that's the direction that we're going. We tolerate everything except exclusivity. Yeah, we don't tolerate that. So. A second thing that happened once uh, Jesus established Himself as the authority in religion and the only way of salvation, first time in the world, there is a final solution offered to life's major problems. In Mark 16, 15, Jesus commands the apostles to go preach the good news to all nations. Okay. The good news is not that only Jesus is you know, salvation. That's not the good news. That's a fact. That's the Bible teaching, but that's not, there's no good news there. You know, if somebody preached that to me 45, 50 years ago, yeah, you know what? Only G, you can only be saved through Jesus. I, yeah, so? Where's the good news? There's no good news there to me. So what is the good news? Well, not only that Jesus is Lord of all, not that people could now go to church and pray and read their Bibles. If that was the good news, I would not have become a Christian. I'd rather sleep in. You know. These are good things, but not the good news. The good news was that God had successfully dealt with man's two oldest problems. Number one, sin. And number two, death. That was the good news. Until Jesus, there was no solution to sin. People kept sinning, and even when they knew what was right or wrong, they still did not have the ability to consistently do what was right. Even if they wanted to, and it's the same today, we continue to sin even when we don't want to. And then the other problem, death. No matter how great or strong or holy people were, they still died. And no one knew for sure what happened afterwards. There were many rituals and magic and theories, but death remained the terrible mystery and destiny of every person. 
And again, things have not changed today. Even with modern medicines, many advancements, everyone still dies at some point. What I find interesting is the psalmist tells us that the average lifespan of man, now he said this 3,000 years ago. He said the average lifespan of man was about 80 years. Psalm 90.10, he says, as for the days of our life, they contain 70 years. Or if due to strength, 80 years. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow, for soon it is gone and we fly away. Whoa, wait a minute. 3,000 years ago, a psalmist said, hmm, average lifespan, 70 years. If you're healthy and strong, maybe 80 years. What is the average lifespan in 2018? 79.5 uh, years. <laughs> With all the advancement of medicine, 79.5 years. However, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter announces the good news. And the heart of this good news is the solution to the problem of sin. He said, uh, he said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Oh, that's good news. That's something I didn't know I had or could have. And so the problem of forgiveness because Jesus has paid the moral debt for man's sins against God by dying on the cross, God can now offer all men forgiveness for sin. The final solution to man's imperfection, to his mistakes, to his disobedience, is God's loving forgiveness. And with that forgiveness comes freedom from guilt, freedom from fear, freedom from the need to perfect self by self, and freedom from condemnation to enjoy a peaceful conscience before God. Man, that's good news, that's, that's, that's a gift. Because every person suffers from those things. Every person suffers from guilt and fear and shame and dread and am I going to make it to heaven or will God accept me? Everybody feels like that. In addition to this, the Holy Spirit gives the disciple of Christ the power to overcome sins. Romans 8, he says, uh, for if you are living in accordance to the flesh, you must die. Well, what is living in accordance to the flesh? Well, disbelief, you know, sinfulness, my way, I do things my way. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Well, what are the deeds of the body? Well, disbelief. So by the Spirit, we continue to believe. We continue to hope. We continue to make an attempt to do what is right according to what God says. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Notice there's no mention here of being perfect. There's no mention here of complete victory. That comes later. He says, if we're being led by the Spirit of God, how do I know I'm being led by the Spirit of God? Well, there's a struggle inside of me, that's how I know. I'm tempted to do something, whatever, something wrong, there's a, pu there's a pull there that says, no, 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 don't do that, do this over here, you know, let's, let's try to do this. You know. The Spirit's leading me. Sometimes I follow, sometimes I don't. But I know He's there because He's leading me, He's encouraging me, okay? The Bible says, if you're following the one who's leading you, you're fine. You're alive spiritually. And then the second problem, uh, death. Um, Jesus clearly announces the final solution to the problem of death, with which every man had to suffer. In John 6, he says, this is the will of him. That, that's the most comforting passage right there for me. This is the will of him who sent me that of all that He has given me, and who are the ones given to Him? Well, the ones who believe in Him, all right? That of all that uh, He has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. Do you understand the passage? It is the will of God that we go to heaven. In other words, God wants you and me to go to heaven. We, we have this thought sometimes that you know, we're, we're hanging on you know, to the cliff, heaven's up there, we're hanging on to the cliff, you know, and God is there with His foot. You know? You know, knocking our, get our fingers off of it. You know, we, we have this idea that he's pushing us away. And it's the complete opposite. God wants us to go to heaven. He, he, he works everything for good. You know, in Romans 8 where he says everything works for the good. What good? 
not that we get a new car or we win the lottery, the good of us being to heaven. God works everything in our lives in such a way that will get us to heaven. Why? Because Jesus said, this is the will of God. He wants all those who believe in Jesus to go to heaven and He works all things together in such a way to guarantee that we make it there. So he's not a, we're not trying and He's pushing back against us. He's working with us. He wants us to go there. For this is the will of my Father that everyone who believes or beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life and I myself will raise Him up on the last day. I, this is the most reassuring passage in the New Testament. God wants us to be with Him in heaven. And so the other problem, death, is overcome by resurrection. Man could now see that death was real, but not final. That's the point. There was life after death, even eternal life. So in his final command, a resurrected man is telling his disciples to go and tell the entire world how God will forgive their sins and give them resurrection and eternal life after death. This was a message never heard or even imagined before. We, you know, even if you're not a believer, you can't help but know about Jesus in our society. Come on, there are churches on every street corner. You know, I mean, we still live in a culture where Jesus is still a presence. Okay. You, you, you can't not know. Uh, you can't not know about, about Jesus. Uh, and the good news. Uh, this is good news. <laughs> the good news that uh, after death we have resurrection. We have that, that promise. And who promised it to us? Somebody who actually rose from the dead themselves. You know, if he would have stayed in the grave and the apostles would have said, you know, he died on the cross and he paid for your sins and uh, he's now dead, but you know, uh, uh, he's going to come back one day. Just take our word for it. He's going to come back one day and so you know, repent, be baptized. You know. I don't know about you, but that would not have been very convincing to me if he's still in the grave. The thing that convinces me is he rose from the dead and my simple mind says, well, if he could do it for him, well, he can do it for me. You know, my mind thinks like that. And I think God realizes all of our minds think like that. He gave us some proof. So this was a message that offered a real solution to man's two greatest problems, sin and death. Forgiveness for sin and resurrection from death, both through Jesus Christ. And you know when you say only Jesus, salvation only through Jesus, the thing is only Jesus offers this as salvation. Buddha doesn't offer forgiveness of sin, doesn't even recognize that sin exists. And the Hindus, you know, they, 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 don't re they, uh, they do recognize you know, karma and, and evil, but they don't, they don't uh, 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 believe in a physical conscious resurrection. In Hinduism, you know, your, your afterlife is just you're absorbed into the, into the great, the Brahma, you know, the, the great God, the force. You're absorbed into the force. You don't have any consciousness. You die and you just, you know, you, you're absorbed. So Christianity, and I have to say uh, Islam also, but even Islam, their view of heaven is very earthly. It's very physical, paradise. You know, they offer uh, you know, the, 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 the jihadist you know, uh, a paradise, you know, many virgins you know, to, to take care of his needs. You know, that's their idea of, of afterlife is very earthly. It's like the best that earth can be. I don't know about you, but I want to get away from earth. <laughs> I want to get away from flesh. All right? So uh, if you're looking at it from a negative point of view, you're saying, well, this Jesus and these Christians, they're awfully, you know, man, they're narrow and they're exclusive. You know? But if you flip it the other way around, you realize he's the only one offering this. Nobody else is offering this. Only Jesus is offering forgiveness for sin, peace of mind now, and resurrection from the dead as a conscious being. I'm going to be me when I resurrect. Now, I won't have this body, but I'm still going to have this, this consciousness of myself. No other religion uh, promises that. 
And so it's exclusive, yes, but it offers things that no other religion offer as well. Okay? So now we've got good news for the guilty sinner who is condemned to die. A third thing that happens, a third thing that happens, the world had to choose. Absolute exclusivity in religion, a final solution is offered, the world has to choose. Three things that happened with Jesus' resurrection and the command to go forth and preach the gospel. So the problems of sin and death were solved by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? Jesus' appearance after His death confirmed His divine nature, His complete authority, and His claim to exclusive loyalty. Who else is going to make that claim except the resurrected Son of God? Jesus now sends out his apostles to confront the world with these facts and force them to choose before he returns one last time to judge all men. I repeat a passage here. He says, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And so the entire issue of life and death is reduced to one choice. Those who believe and are baptized will be saved meaning that forgiveness and resurrection and eternal life belong to that person who believes and is baptized, and those who disbelieve and consequently refuse to be baptized. Some people argue against baptism. They say, well, look, it says right here, those you know, who, who, who don't believe, uh, it doesn't say that, that they were baptized. Well, of course not. If you don't believe, there's no reason for you to be baptized. Baptism is only for the believers. The unbelievers, of course, they're going to reject baptism. Okay? Those who disbelieve and consequently refuse baptism will be condemned, found guilty of sin, punished to an eternity of suffering, away from God. People ask, well, what's the suffering like? Well, I think, I think that Jesus answers that. You're away from God, whatever, form of suffering that is, being away from God is suffering in itself. And so the choice is exclusive. It's one or the other. It's terrifying when you consider the options. It attacks my privacy and my sense of independence because you see, I don't want to choose. I want to just keep bumping along the way I am. I'm not committed to any God. I'm not committed to any religion. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. You know, that's the way I'd like to be. But this choice right here, you know, slaps me up the side of the head and says, you got to choose. It weighs a million tons on my conscience until I answer it. It's demanding, it's urgent, it's offensive because it judges me. And it makes me angry because now that I know what the choice is, I want to say, why do you make me choose? Because being neutral is so much more comfortable. So through the gospel, God brings us face to face with reality. For the first time in history, men could come to the edge and look into eternity and face the incredible responsibility of choosing to live or die. For most, pride and attachment to sin caused them to actually throw away the opportunity to live forever in exchange for the momentary sinful pleasures of this world. In other words, the sin and pleasure that they know now is better than something they don't know in the future. But Luke tells us of the thousands who after you know, having been given the choice, gladly responded to God's gracious offer of forgiveness uh, and life after death, Acts 2, 41. So then, you know, after the preaching of Peter, those who had received his word were baptized and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Again, the debate about baptism. Not only do we have uh, contextual proof, you know, uh, baptism is always in context with a discussion on salvation. In other words, whenever they talk about salvation in the New Testament, baptism is in there. You know, contextually it's in there. And here, as, as far as an example, show me an, someone says, show me an example in the Bible. One writer said, show me an example in the Bible where people who believe were baptized. Sure. <laughs> How many do you want? <laughs> there are 10 in the book of Acts alone. Imagine. We've often said you know, in, in Bible study, 
If Jesus says it one time, it's good enough. If He says something one time, it's good enough. Twice, you better pay attention. You know? Verily, verily, you know? verily, verily, I'm telling you twice, pay attention. But when He tells it to you 10 times, and yet our world is like that, right? I've said to this group before, you know, 100 years ago, 100 years ago, if you had uh, homosexuals uh, marching in a parade, promoting homosexuality and rejoicing in it and glorifying it, it would be unheard of. You, you'd be attacked for even suggesting such a thing, right? Look at the crazy world we live in now. I mean, it's, I thought, you know, it got me too. I thought that was like, whoa, you know, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago uh, when I put out that book on, uh, on, on homosexuality. And now, are you kidding me? I mean, now we've got 80 different ways uh, of perverting our sexual nature, uh, being accepted and promoted and celebrated. So yeah, we should never be surprised to the extent the world can be crazy, that, that it can reject the most basic things. Okay. Especially, in, especially in, uh, in religion. So uh, Jesus' final command to tell the world about God's solution to sin and death through His death and resurrection was truly a turning point in the history of mankind. With it, God established Jesus as the only Lord and Savior. No one could please God or come to God except through Him. With it, He also revealed God's solution to sin and death forgiveness and a promise of resurrection. And with it, he also presented a clear choice to all men, believe in him and be baptized for salvation or perish in your sin. The choice was painfully clear and simple. And so that final command was first preached by the apostles and then handed on to every generation of Christians to present to their society and it needs to be passed on by us until Jesus returns. Those little kids that are running around the building, you know, Sunday, knocking over our seniors and you know, <laughs> getting a lot of people upset, you know, those, those kids running around, they're the ones that are going to have to preach the gospel to the world. And where are they going to learn that? Well, they're going to learn it here. They're going to learn about the, the sharp end of the sword, if you wish, which is telling the world this message, which is not popular now and probably will be even less popular when they grow up. But they're also going to be able to preach the comfort of the Holy Spirit as well for those who, for those who believe. So it's no different for our generation. The final command stands before us in all of its urgency and terror and promise and glory. Every one of us must make a choice concerning our eternal destiny based on these words of Jesus. Those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Some of us, of course, have already believed and been baptized and for this reason will be saved. I mean, we're saved because we believe, because that's the second most amount of mail or comments that I get. People say, well, you, you believe in a works type of salvation because we say you need to be baptized. But we understand that we're saved because of faith. Nothing we do can save us. We're saved because we believe in Jesus. But Jesus has said the way you express your faith initially is by repentance and baptism. That's what we're, that's what we're teaching. Okay. Uh, sadly, other people have completely rejected this and they refuse to believe and are assured of an eternity of suffering. Make no mistake about this, God is not a fool. He does not make empty promises. So I urge everyone to take seriously the, mes the message contained in Jesus' last command. All right, so there's Jesus' last command. We've got one more lesson in this uh, series and it'll be uh, next Sunday. His last gift, Jesus' last gift. All right, thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs>